So in a ton, the Belgian Congo ore had 2,000 pounds, kicked the dust with 20 pounds. Then it, now we're at two pounds, now we're at two tenths of a pound, and we're very rapidly he he heading toward two hundredths of a pound of uranium in a ton of Earth. So we're stripping the, the, the planet of uh, the, high, um, the high density uranium and going for um, smaller and smaller quantities of, of, rate of uranium in a pound of Earth. Um, a, a source of uranium is the uh, Jordanian desert. Um, and it's at a thousandth of a percent. And believe it or not, uranium prospectors are looking at Jordan saying, like, you know, 20 years out, we can take that whole desert and for, for every pound, we'll get 0 0.001 pounds of uranium out of it. So it's, it, it is becoming an incredible um, venture as far as the, the mining end goes. So when you hear clean, safe, reliable, you've you got to look at this whole cycle. And I'll talk about the other end of the cycle. But the front end of the cycle, uh, we talk about mountaintop mining in West Virginia. The same thing's happening in, in uranium mining because the quality of uranium that we're discovering now is nowhere near what was available in the 1940s. Okay, so the disadvantages get back to those two pieces of uh, um, called daughter products. When you split the uranium, the daughter products are the, um, are the disadvantages. And that's that and that. So there's your uranium. It splits, and the two daughter products are the uranium. If this stopped at, at, at um, giving off an enormous amount of heat, we wouldn't be here today. Um, but the problem is what's left after the split. So the daughter products have two main problems associated with them. One is that they're physically hot for on the order of three, four, five, six, seven years. And the second one is that they're radio, radioactive for centuries. So you know, I'll talk about each one of those separately. Um, a lot of people didn't realize about the physical heat until Chernobyl happened and then Fukushima. I guess I want to, before I, I, I skip the slide in my mind here, um, those daughter products emit radiation and there's four types of radiation. Um, the four types are, there's three of them are particles, physical things, an alpha particle, a beta particle, and a neutron. And the other one is a gamma ray. And so th this is an electromagnetic spectrum on the bottom there. And light is a ray. And as light gets more energetic, it becomes ultraviolet. More energetic still, it becomes x-rays. And more energetic still, it becomes a gamma ray. So these gamma rays that a nuclear power plant emits are nothing but a high energy x-ray. Now, What's going on there, though, and we'll talk about the gamma first. Um, gammas penetrate you from the outside. So, for instance, if you're near Vermont Yankee, the, the, the reactor and the turbine are giving off what they call sky shine. And those are gamma rays that bounce off of the air molecules and rain back down on, um, on the Earth. Um, very similar to an X-ray. There's not a lot of scientific argument about the effect of an external gamma ray on your body. The scientific arguments come about the effect of those other particles, the alpha particle, the beta particle, and the neutron, when they get inside you. And this is what, what's called a hot particle. So um, these are much larger particles, but they don't penetrate as far. So if I had an alpha emitter and I laid it on my skin, it would, would not even penetrate the first layer of my skin. Same with a beta particle. Neutron's a little different. But so they're not penetrating when they're outside your body. But the problem becomes when you ingest them by breathing or um, uh, drinking them in or, or eating them in, then they launch in an organ. And the scientific argument that's occurring right now is over the effect not of the radiation that shines down on people, but on the effect of the radiation that you get inside your body. So that's what um, the big argument is about. Now, there's two camps here in the scientific community. The um, nuclear industry and the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, the Japanese government, um, all subscribe to the um, International Council on Radiation Protection, ICRP. Um, 
And I call that the uh, Bobby McFarlane camp, you know, the, the don't worry, be happy camp. And, and on the other side, there's the ECRR and like-minded scientists. And the issue is what that radiation does when it gets in your body. Yes? What's the ECRR? Uh, European Commission on Radiological Risk. Um, there are other groups too, but, but just on the on the opposite poles, there are there are some other ones. Yes, ECRR is European Commission on Radiological Risk. Um, yes. You said there's no real argument about the effects of gamma rays, sky shine, but it's not clear. Can you clarify what you mean? Oh, when 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 you hear, you know, you get about as much radiation um, flying in an airplane. As you're, that, those issues about a millirem of external radiation falling on you, um, I don't think either of the parties, and it's actually a much broader spectrum, but we'll call it the, the, uh, uh, the, the oh my God, it's really bad, and the don't worry, be happy camp. Um, those are, between those two, um, they would still agree that a flight on an airplane is relatively inconsequential um, because it's external radiation. But the, the, the problem becomes when... Um, when the particle is ingested, that's where the big scientific discrepancy uh, begins. The yeah, um, I'll take a bunch of questions later, but the, this gamma radiation that's shining down, um, we are bombarded every day by cosmic rays. And the... Um, um, the cosmic rays we're bombarded on are about 100 millirem a, a year. And everybody in the, on the one camp will say, well, if we can withstand these gamma rays, a, a little cesium atom in our lungs is no big deal. So that issue of um, um, comparing an external exposure, which most scientists don't argue about, versus the internal uh, exposure of picking up a hot particle, is, is uh, the, the issue where scientific, scientists disagree. Okay, so um, now on that, here's the difference. And uh, the, the, there are, uh, I'm sure there's thousands and thousands of pages written about this difference. But the difference basically is that if you get some cesium inside your body or any other isotope, um, what the ICRRP, the ICRP group would say is they'll take the energy emitted by that radioactive cesium and they'll average it over most of the whole organ. So if I've got a cesium particle lodged in my lung, they'll average that energy over my whole lung. Now what the other scientists feel is that that's really not fair. What's happening is that that energy is not dissipated over the whole lung. It doesn't go very far at all. But in the distance it goes, it creates much destruction. So the opposite camp is saying that the, uh, the, the radiation does a lot of local damage. And once you've created that local damage, sometimes your body generates a cancer as a result. So the, the difference in the camps is, do I average that energy over the whole lung, or do I average it over a, a relatively small area around the particle? Now, I just had a great explanation of this explained to me um, just about two days ago, and I'm going to share it with you. The, the ICRP, the, the Bobby McFarlane crowd, it, it thinks of a lung as, think of a stadium with, a, with 100,000 people in it. Yeah, that's, that's the whole lung. And in the middle is somebody with a high-powered rifle and 10 rounds of ammunition. Well, that person fires 10 times into the crowd. The ICRP's position is that, well, on average, that energy didn't hurt much. <laughs> now, the, the flip side of that argument is that the ECRR and, and those other scientists realized that 10 people up there, it really hurt a lot. And the other 900 and 999, whatever, the remainder of the group in the stadium had, had no exposure. So that basically is the difference in the two camps. I subscribe to the, the camp that there's a lot of local damage caused. Not all the time does it cause cancer. A lot of times your body will isolate it or, or repair it, but it's more ca cancer, cancerous than the International Council would, um, would, would suggest. Now, um, the, the, I, there's a, gonna, we have a book here, and it's put out by, by three 
uh, doctors and physicists that, um, actually that, that are in the camp that supports this very local high energy exposure. Um, it's called Chernobyl Consequences of a Catastrophe. And its um, primary author is a guy named Yablikov. Um, this, it, this is beginning to turn the tide. Um, the ICRP um, was trying to say that basically Chernobyl killed almost no one. Yablikov saying it's more than a million. And the data on Chernobyl is beginning to support Yablikov as opposed to the ICRP. So I think the tide is changing here. Uh, but you know, Chernobyl was 25 years ago. So you'll hear um, health physicists talk about the um, uh, um, health physicists or people that do this for a living. Um, we'll talk about Fukushima being, um, I've heard numbers as low as maybe a couple hundred people may die of cancer. And I've heard numbers say as many as two million may die of cancer. And the difference is not really about that external cloud that the plant released in the first day or two. The difference is about what the people are inhaling now or imbibing now that stays in the ecosystem for a long, long time. So, all right, let's go to my next slide here. So the daughter products have two problems. The first one is heat. Um, we really didn't know too much, well, the scientists did, but, but I don't think it was really publicly understood that when you shut a nuclear reactor down, you don't shut a nuclear reactor down. The chain reaction stops. There's no more splitting of the uranium. That happens immediately. So when you hear the reactor's been shut down safely, that means the splitting has stopped. But these pieces, these daughter products, remain physically hot for years. And it, at Fukushima, for instance, let's talk about that two and a half million horses. When the reactor shuts down, there's still 5% of the horses still in the room. So 5% doesn't sound like a lot, but it's 150,000 horses in your bedroom. That's a lot of heat that has to be gotten rid of. And of course, at Fukushima, they didn't get rid of the heat, and, and the consequences are right there, uh, right there to be seen. Now, Fukushima is exactly uh, the same as Fukushima 2 and 3 are exactly the same as Vermont Yankee. Uh, Fukushima 1 is slightly older. Um, and if you look at it from, um, from left to right, it's Fukushima 1, 2, 3, and 4. And this picture was taken before Unit 4 blew up, but while Unit 4 was on fire. So um, the two smoldering buildings there are Unit 3 and Unit 4. Um, their containments are designed to contain the radiation. Uh, I, I think we can all agree it didn't work. It didn't work not just once, not just twice. It didn't work three times out of the three times it was tried. So this is the first real test of a, um, of a boiling water reactor containment, and it went 0 for 3. Um, the, the consequences there will be, will, will be will, uh, determined over years and years. So Vermont Yankee has the same containment. Um, there's a vent on the containment that was designed to be opened. Now this is interesting, because this containment was designed by guys using slide rules in the 60s. By the early 70s, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission realized that this containment was not a good design. And there's actually memos that say, we never should have licensed this. But if we say no now, we'll kill the industry. So the, those, uh, then in the 80s, they realized this is a really bad design. So the vents were added in the 80s to a design that was built in the 60s. Containments and venting don't go together. You know, if you're going to contain something, the last thing you want to do is open a spigot to let it out. Um, and what happened at Fukushima is these containment vents that were added in the 80s to correct the problem from the 60s didn't work anyway. Um, there's 30, well, there's 23 reactors in the United States identical to this. For my Yankees, one, Pilgrims, one, Oyster Creek is one on the East Coast. Um, Inland, there's a, there's a bunch in Illinois right near Chicago. There's, uh, uh, the Dresden units, for example, are right near Chicago. And those are even older. Those are very similar to Fukushima 1, which is the first one to blow. And then there's some in the South, Hatch and um, uh, Browns Ferry at uh, Tennessee Valley Authority. So they're spread out throughout the, the, uh, the country. And then there's another couple dozen elsewhere, including Germany. And Germany actually decided to shut those down now, not, not 10 years from now, but they're shutting down these old boiling water reactors now.